All right, thank you so much for being with us on 89.7 Contact FM. Thank you also for those who have been following keenly and uh, wishing to watch some of our shows on our YouTube channel. Thank you so much for being with us. Indeed, this is one-on-one and, of course, the hashtag to use to get interactive with us on our social media platforms like Twitter is 101RW. My name is Eugene and Nangwe. As promised, uh, we are going to be talking matters public utilities regulation and my guest in studio is none other than Mr. Patrick Nirishema who is the Deje of Rura. Welcome to One on One, sir. Thank you very much. It's been much, a long sir. time coming. We've really been trying to have you on the show. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thanks, yes. Eugene. Yes. Thanks Just to clear the perception because there's a time we had announced you would be coming uh, we had expected and then it didn't, it didn't work out. Probably w- what happened is it is it a matter of information not reaching you that uh, uh, we needed you or what uh, no it was just scheduling difficulties okay scheduling difficulties i had uh, to travel which came on a short notice okay and so my whole schedule changed so. all right but all is good yeah, we very, have you right good. finally so very let's let, let, yes let's talk about you settling in this institution uh, because uh, you've come in and, and there's a lot on the table uh, a lot of things that you come and find in the intray, for example, handling the digital migration for the country, uh, the issues of uh, mobile penetration levels. Then just a few days ago, we had the Smart Rwanda and, 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 and there was stuff that, you know, your institution is, 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 is required to be able to oversee uh, uh, among other things that you need to regulate as, as in terms of public utilities. How are you settling in? Um, well, I must say that... Uh, or you already settled in. <laughs> absolutely, yes. <laughs> yes. Absolutely, yes. I'm uh, well settled in. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, all the things you listed are actually within the ICT sector. Mm-hmm. Uh, but Rura, as a public utilities regulator, we actually regulate multi, uh, we're a multi-sector regulator, meaning that uh, we deal with ICT, which includes telco, mm-hmm. being the largest in the ICT. Mm-hmm. We deal with transport. We deal with energy. Mm-hmm. We deal with uh, water, we deal with sanitation, we deal with media. So it it is quite... uh, Extensive. Yes, the breadth is quite uh, extensive. Mm -hmm. Uh, But like you said, I'm uh, well settled in. Mm -hmm. Is this this too much for one institution to regulate? I wouldn't say it's too much for one institution to regulate. Um, uh, It all depends how the institution is organized Mm. uh, to begin with. So if you have the right uh, capacity in place, mm-hmm. if you are structured the right way, um, it shouldn't be a difficult uh, thing to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have many other institutions in Rwanda that have quite a broad scope mm-hmm. uh, of coverage and they still are able to run those institutions. Mm-hmm. So it's not a question of uh, how many utilities we regulate, it's a question of building the right capacities to deal with each of these sectors. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The reason I ask this question is because we have had several uh, recurring complaints on several issues and, and, and some of them uh, have involved the issues of the telecom uh, companies, especially on the issue of uh, unsolicited messages, which many people have always come knocking on your door asking what's going on, Rura, I, what, what's happening? Uh, we have complained, but we still see these things happening. What's the official's position <coughs> today? Okay. Um Let's uh, let's deal with that issue. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. First of all, as a utilities regulator, we deal with complaints, whether it's from ICT, from transport, and, and so on and so forth. So uh, we have the job to look into these complaints and be able to, to, to deal with them, um, or at least provide an explanation why things are, are the way happening they are. the way they are, yes. Now, unsolicited, uh, unsolicited SMSs are of two kinds. Mm-hmm. One kind is the kind of messages which uh, are subscribed to and in fact uh, where the recipient usually pays a small fee Mm -hmm. for those messages. Mm -hmm. Now, for a service like that, uh, this could be with your bank, it could be with um, some business that sends you messages. Or other social messages. Or social messages. Now, that one, usually the telecom companies have total control over it. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we have required, and we put this, we have regulations guiding this, we have required uh, telecom operators to provide an option to unscribe. So or you should be able to, yes. you, you subscribe mm-hmm. and then you also unsubscribe. Mm-hmm. Meaning that you should have an option to stop this message from coming to you. Mm-hmm. So that kind of uh, message is easy to deal with. Now there are other messages which are like how you normally send an SMS. Mm-hmm. 
So somebody generates a list of uh, numbers and broadcasts a message. A bulk. A bulk, bulk SMS. Message. Yes. Mm-hmm. Just like you can send an SMS to, you have a big group of friends, you send them a message. Mm-hmm. The telecom operator is not a part of what you're doing. Mm-hmm. In that case, what we do is when we see messages like this or we get a complaint, then we contact the telecom company responsible and then we look for the number that generated these messages and then we have to talk to those people directly to say, please stop sending messages. Mm-hmm. So that one is normally just a normal broadcast message sent from one user, and the telecom operator does not have control over it. Because most of the time, the 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 subscribers, or I mean, the owners of these numbers have complained and said, "Why would my you know uh, mobile network allow such kind of messages to come through to my uh, phone? Yet I haven't subscribed or not uh, unsubscribed to it. I mean, how then do we deal with this? Um, uh, because when you say that." the telecoms have no control over this. Probably there's a social event coming up and all of a sudden I see a message coming from the organizers of that event and and they've sent me a bulk SMS alongside many other people. Mm. How does Rura come in to regulate this uh, area without, uh, you know, uh, uh, with, with a way of finding a final solution to it? How does Rura come in here? Okay. Uh, first of all, there is no straight technical solution to that problem. Mm-hmm. The solution lies with how we send the message out to discourage people from doing this. Mm-hmm. And whenever it occurs, as I said, we work with telecom operators and we ask them, we say, such and such a message uh, is being propagated, is being broadcast. It's not good because it's an unsolicited message. And then the telecom operator will identify because obviously all the subscribers, they, they have a database of those. Then you deal with the person who has sent this message and you, you give them a warning, please don't send messages that are unsolicited. Mm-hmm. Now, for the person who receives, mm. the reason I said there's no technical solution is because blocking those messages is the same as blocking any SMS that is coming to you. Mm-hmm. That's why I said mm-hmm. there's no straight mm. uh, technical solution. So we should just brace ourselves for more of these SMSs to come through our phones. We, we need to do more public awareness. Uh, whenever we get a complaint, we have to work with telcos, deal with that specific individual that has done that. But upfront, because of the way the technology works and the way the SMSs work, uh, it's difficult to have a way of preventing it way ahead of time. Mm. Because when you say that, it yeah. brings a, a worry in the minds of some. Because if mm. we say it is difficult to control the way they come into some of our phones, then probably we could be even at a risk of someone sitting somewhere mm. and just broadcasts some negative messages or, or SMSs to a multiple number of people without being noticed before sending it. Don't you feel that this is a ticking time bomb for those who probably no, no, would want no, to not really. send such messages if we no. can't regulate them technically? You, you see, you have to understand how the technology works. It's like uh, somebody sending a tweet. Mm-hmm. Somebody can decide to send a negative tweet. Mm-hmm. Now, how, how do you prevent somebody from sending it? You deal, first of all, uh, there has to be a lot of public awareness mm-hmm. on these issues. That's mm-hmm. number one. Mm-hmm. Number two, the communications technologies have evolved. We're in the era of social networking. Mm-hmm. We're just talking about SMS, but you know, there are multiple social network technologies that are out there. Mm. And so the, I think the solution is not to block people from communicating. People should be free, and I think we're a democratic uh, country where we encourage free exchange of ideas, uh, and, and that's good for the nation. Mm. Now, uh, sending a negative message, well, just sending a message in itself I don't think is harmful. Mm-hmm. How we deal with that is the issue. I think if it happens and this message has some harm that we see, then of course we have to deal with the individual who did that. Mm. But deciding and blocking, you can't just block SMS. SMS. Mm-hmm. It's like I send an SMS to you. Mm-hmm. So you can choose and block and only receive from restricted numbers. And that can be done. Mm-hmm. But you cannot do it on a massive scale. Mm. Yeah. So, so today, today yeah. as we speak, for that listener of mine who's been waiting to have a, f- a formal answer on what they're able to do or what they're not able to do, when a telecom uh, 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 sends them a message which requires to have that subscribe or unsubscribe, and yet it doesn't have, then they should report. What it. are they able to do? Then they should report it. They should be- report it to Rura. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We have uh, put clear regulations that require that. 
And I'm beginning to see that, by the way. Okay. I'm beginning to see that. Um, so we need to enforce it more. So if you get a message, you don't have an option to unscribe, then forward it to us, and then we should be able to deal with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What's, 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 what's the limit? What's the maximum kind of punishment or punitive measures that can be carried out when you say we need to maximize on reinforcing or reinforcing that? Well, a regulator has multiple things. They're all really within the realm of um, administrative measures. Mm. Uh, we do sanctions. We can impose fines. We can... So depending on the gravity of a particular situation, um, we, we make a judgment and say this is the kind of um, measure that we'll take. Mm. Uh, for a lot of issues, of course, we're normally able to resolve them without having to, re- to, to, to revert to punitive measures. Mm. But uh, when the need arises, we've done that in the past, mm-hmm. then we have to either put uh, fines, financial fines. We've had cases where we had to impose daily fines, which they pay until they solve an issue. Um, there was a time MTN Network had issues um, some time back, I remember, and we had to impose a fine. Mm-hmm. So they had to pay money on a daily basis until they fix the problem. Okay, so this is how fight that, can that go. Went, that went on for about a month. So this 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 happens okay. um, in cases where we really have to put our foot down. Mm. Still yeah. remaining with the issues of telecoms and mobile phones and, and, and all that, just recently there was a public announcement that we have already hit 70% of uh, mobile penetration in, in the country. And a few years ago, when we were talking about this issue of penetration levels, when it was still low, there was a call that we have to reach a certain number, and that was around 40, and then it went to 60, uh, before we can have number portability. Today, there are those who are saying, finally, we are at 70. So what are we still waiting for to get to have number portability in the country? Okay. Um, first of all, number portability can be implemented uh, regardless of the penetration. So those who are telling us that time were lying to us? No, they were not. Mm-hmm. Um, the point that uh, the regulator made and we we made until now was, number one, we wanted to ensure that each operator on their own before we allow number portability mm. attains a certain uh, penetration. So we wanted to maximize the penetration of each Yes, before we operator. allow people to move around. Meaning that uh, when there's number portability, uh, the shift of the telcos ten, uh, tends to, to, to shift towards competing for the existing subscribers. Mm. And so uh, the reason, and that's why I'm explaining this now, mm. Uh, the reason that penetration is important before you introduce num- mobile number portability is that you force the operators to look for those that are currently not subscribed, mm-hmm. who are not, uh, who don't have subscriptions. Mm-hmm. So that they reach that number, then you're uh-huh. able to, so, to compete. So that's what we've been pushing mostly. Mm-hmm. But, but there are other considerations as well. Um, one is that mobile number portability comes with a cost. So there's a cost attached to implementing mobile number portability. A cost who who has to foot the bill? The operators. The operators. The operators. So, 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 t- uh-huh. so the operators have got to foot a bill to be able to implement mobile number portability. Mm-hmm. And usually the, the bill is shared according to pretty much the, the, the market share that each operator has. Mm-hmm. And so... Um, Today, MTN is 50%, uh, Tigo is 35%, Airtel is 15%. So you would pretty much share it around those lines. Those lines. The, the cost attached to this. So as you speak today, it's still a pipe dream for Rwanda to have mobile number portability? or. Oh, yes, it is. It is. We've just, um, we actually did uh, a study because we also wanted to have some, some, somebody with the right expertise mm-hmm. uh, and who has been involved in this in different countries to help uh, take uh, an expert view mm. of the current landscape and advise with options. So the study is has actually just been concluded. Uh, the, the consultant submitted the findings to us. Um, within the next few weeks, we'll have uh, a stakeholder consultation to consider these uh, recommendations mm-hmm. and then determine the way forward. Are you able to tell us probably how things look like? when, how long probably should Rwandans wait for this? Um, I wouldn't want to preempt that right now. What I would say, though, is mobile number portability, uh, we're going to do it. Mm-hmm. You know, sooner or later, we'll do it. Mm-hmm. 
um, if I look in the region, uh, already Tanzania is in the process of doing that. Kenya is slightly ahead mm-hmm. uh, of, of, of Tanzania in terms of implementing it. Um, they are not showing, Kenya is not showing much benefit if you do the cost benefit analysis um, on the mobile number portability they have done. Nonetheless, it's too soon to tell. Mm-hmm. Uh, Uganda, like Rwanda, is still considering it. So overall, even for the sake of giving uh, the mobile subscribers option, if I don't like uh, the company to um, which I'm, I'm subscribed, op- yes. mm. I shouldn't be held hostage because I do not want to change the number. I should be able to move with my number and go to a different service provider. So, so as you sit so in your we'll, yeah. as you sit in your meetings discussing and receiving these reports on some of these studies that are being done, what timeline do you give your team? What timeline do you give uh, the operators uh, to be able to? give this opportunity for the you know customers to be able to choose which network they want to be without necessarily losing their numbers well the actual implementation itself takes time Mm -hmm. so the total implementation uh, would take approximately one year okay to to complete because it's what telcos need to do within their networks to be able to permit uh, this mobility of numbers between different telcos Mm -hmm. um so as i said um Within the next few weeks, actually early November, we'll have uh, a stakeholder consultation that includes the policymakers, the operators, all that are concerned mm. um, to, to now determine the roadmap. So doing it is no longer the question. The question is the actual roadmap, when, the timing, to make sure that uh, it's done properly. Okay. Uh, there's also, I need to also point out that the, for it to succeed, there are certain prerequisites that need to be in place. Um, and so we also need to be looking at that. Um, so it's, it's multiple things. You look at the economics of it, the cost benefit analysis. Uh, you look at the timing issues to say this is actually the right time. Um, you know, so as we speak, as we speak already, we can tell that it will be, um, one year plus. Some, some some time because you said the, the the time for implementation is normally one, one year, one year. then one probably year. by the time now you, the, the, the research comes and then there's this discussion on the round table it could be plus some moments so literally we can say approximately one year and some months right yes, yes that's right. correct cool so let's 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 move a bit on to some other issues that uh, you also regulate as the regulator and that is the issue of uh, public transport where we have had a, b- a bit of complaints from some people who say Listen, from the day we started mm-hmm. traveling using public transport, the fares have always been going up. Whether the petrol prices go up or down, there's no day that they hear that, okay, when they're told by the conductors or the owners of these buses, they're told the petrol prices are high. And this is why the explanation as to why the costs of fares are high. But during the times when there's an announcement that the fuel prices have gone down, there's never a review downwards of public transport. Could be could you be able to analyze or tell us how do these numbers uh, get reached at? And is there a day in the dreams of many that we will hear that public transport has gone down? <laughs> That's a very good question. Mm. Uh, first of all, I think the biggest problem in transport is not necessarily mm-hmm. um, the, the, the tariff. Mm-hmm. I don't think that is the biggest problem in transport. Mm-hmm. It's part we, of, we, of, of it's, the it's, it's mm. one of many issues. And quite honestly, I don't think the tariff today, um, the complaints we get, um, tariff is not really doesn't feature that much. It doesn't feature that much. Um, the complaints we have are more on how, the convenience part of it. Uh, people standing on queues for a long time waiting mm-hmm. for vehicles. Mm-hmm. Um, in the past, there were problems which we have now solved, by the way, uh, where you would have public transporters taking, um, you know, people and they don't arrive at the destination mm, and mm. they stop somewhere halfway. Mm. Um, the uncertainty of not knowing whether there will be uh, a bus or not. Uh, in the past, before we organized the transport sector, uh, there was no program. You just go on the road. You do not know whether you get, a, you know, a bus or not. Mm. But now, um, having organized the transport sector, uh, the routes which the buses use are defined. The times where the buses operate are defined. Mm-hmm. You know, but it starts from 5 a.m. in the morning, mm-hmm. it goes to 11 p.m. Mm. 
Uh, there are no longer cases where uh, somebody is driving uh, a bus, gets halfway, sees uh, a big number of people waiting on the road going in the opposite direction. Changes the route. And then does a U-turn. Those mm. things not, don't happen anymore. Mm. Uh, we had a big problem, especially in the evenings, you know, peak hours or in the mornings when people are either going to work or going home. Mm. By and large, I think these problems have been dealt with to a very big extent. Mm -hmm. uh, we have inspectors in the roads. We monitor how long people stay on the road waiting. Uh, we monitor every single parameter. We monitor how many people are in the bus. We monitor... We monitor the routes to make sure they are sticking with the routes. We have uh, significantly increased the routes. In fact, we have added, I think, 24 new routes within the city where buses never, mm. were used, not to go. Go, never used to go. Mm. So I think that uh, the tariff for me, as far as I'm concerned, is not the big problem. I think the prices have really been relatively stable. You look over the last two decades and you see very small increase of the tariff over two decades. So quite honestly, I think... Tariff is not the big issue here. So, so what of those who want to argue along those lines of those reasons that are usually given as to mm. why the increase takes place? Uh, sticking to the issue of uh, the fuel prices, which sometimes they say, and which also fluctuates at some point. How do you answer that, Muturaji, who has that concern? That, listen, you're telling me that the prices uh, of, of fare have increased because of fuel prices, but now the fuel prices I've heard on the radio that have gone down why haven't you reduced the prices of our fare? Um, well, let's uh, l l l l let's bring clarity on this. First mm -hmm. of all, mm -hmm. it's true that when we're looking at the tariff of transport, we consider many, many factors, um, including the cost of fuel. Mm. Uh, but it's not the only factor you look at. We're currently in a phase where we're trying to grow the transport sector. Uh, you, you know, you see people introducing a lot of buses in the city. Uh, so these operators are taking big loans, mm -hmm. They're taking, you know, millions of dollars of loans. So if an operator takes, for example, you know, $6 million and takes a loan, uh, you, you want to make sure that this operator can operate stably, can have a projection on the revenues, can be able to service the loans. So you, you cannot be just putting up and down uh, so you're trying to facilitate to them in paying back their loans through the people's public uh, transport fares? No, we're mm. trying to ensure mm. that we build a credible and sustainable public transport system. Mm -hmm. So if, if, if the, the fluctuation of the petrol price um, also is within a particular range, there was a time when it really fluctuated. But that's probably two two years ago or so. Mm, mm. After that, we've had a relatively stable period. So from the time, for example, we did the last review, petrol prices have been relatively stable. Mm -hmm. So if you ask over a long haul, uh, you, you cannot be changing the price every time the price of petrol, very, you know, there's a small variation. Mm. You only adjust the transport fare if there's a significant variation. Because you also need to create uh, some degree of stability. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some degree of stability. You don't want the fare that keeps, you know, tracking the the, 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 the price of fare. If you remove a few francs, then you remove a few francs on transport. No, you cannot work like that because the cost of transport is not just a cost of fuel. Mm -hmm. There are many other cost elements within, you know, that the transporter has got to manage to be able to successfully run and, and, and sustain the operations. So petrol is only one parameter. Yeah, so okay. you just don't look at petrol alone. As, no. as, as one of the no, issues. No. All right. So uh, due to time again, uh, I'd just like to quickly bring in the issue of uh, the digital migration, which uh, we, we, we we did a few uh, weeks ago. And, and, and maybe some people would be uh, adapting to this change. And, and as you look at the situation today uh, on the ground, are we rushing? Do you feel that was the right time? Do you feel that on the ground... People were ready for this because at the end of the day, 2015 is is, 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 is is the deadline, the global deadline for digital migration. We are seeing in Kenya, there's a push and pull over this whole issue. In Tanzania, the same. They were the first ones to migrate. But again, some went to court saying we rushed. And so we want to reverse this decision. What What is your take on, on, on this process? Well, I think each nation, each country has its own peculiarity. Mm -hmm. In the case of Rwanda, I, I don't think we have rushed. We allowed over one year 
for people to prepare to get set of boxes mm-hmm. um we put the message out there it was always out in the media we really uh, allowed as much time as we could and we also did it in a phased manner so we were switching off transmitters in a gradual process mm-hmm. and so by the time we switched off the last three transmitters which was end of July 31st of July you know we had been in this for for over a year now a year in Rwanda is a long period of time mm-hmm. we were a nation on the move mm-hmm. um and there are a lot of benefits that go with digital migration and so to hold the nation back uh just for the sake of waiting for 2015 would have not make uh, would not make any sense at all mm-hmm. so as a regulator we believe the nation was ready um the message was out there set top boxes were out there were you know there were four different suppliers we allowed you know one year plus for people to migrate uh we made sure that the population is adequately informed mm. and so we, we we look at the number one we don't think um we had to wait until 2015, 2015. that yeah. is the absolute shutdown globally so you don't wait for that okay and be- second we didn't want to hold the population from getting benefits of digital migration so why should they be held back until 2015 mm-hmm. we we're nation on the move so whatever we can do and it, move quickly will be done will have to be done all right so so in conclusion as we finish still on monitoring of this uh, migration process i'm sure more p- players will be coming in who have this set of boxes but uh, there has been concern of the compromise of the quality of the set of boxes some people bringing in set of boxes which are of low quality the signal strength is low uh, just an assurance in, in in just less than 60 seconds as we close what assurance does rura give the public on this area No, we've put standards. We've uh, screened the process of the companies that bring these set of boxes and we're satisfied that the set of boxes they bring should be of good quality. Mm-hmm. Now, should there be a particular problem with uh, a device that any user has, then they should bring it to our attention. We've had a few cases which we dealt with uh, very specifically. Uh, if somebody raises an issue, then we deal with it. Then mm-hmm. the supply has got to change. It happens sometimes. You might have a defective box. Mm-hmm. This happens in technology, mm-hmm. but the supplier has the obligation to replace and give um, a working device. All right. So they should just get in touch with the office. Oh yes. Oh, yes. Thank you so much, Patrick. This is the the time we had for this particular interview. Asante for your time, and he's hoping that uh, all is just going to be well in your side, and of course for the public as well. Absolutely. Thank you so much. There you, you have it. One on one featuring uh, the Director General of Rura, uh, Mr. Patrick Nirishama. He has just told us all the issues concerning the public transport and much more right here on the program. Let's keep uh, the conversation going. The hashtag to use is 101RW. See you again next time for much more interviews just like this one. Goodbye for now. <laughs>